Um, for I changed my title a little bit in order to get a few more studies in than just choice blindness, which is what I normally talk about, uh, the major part of the research I've done. Uh, so I, I did so because I realized there was a, some sort of common pattern in the studies we've done, uh, uh, which is they involve some element of self-perception, some sort of ele element of self-inference that we're not aware of. Uh, so in all these four studies or types of studies, it ha they have this character. So uh, I will then use Ananda's very broad conception of implicit cognition. This is just simply that the participants, there is an element of uh, the experiments I'll describe where the participants are not aware that they are looking at themselves and making some sort of interpretation or inference. Um, I'll start with uh, choice blindness and, and how that relates to preference and preference change. Uh, and also, for me, this is a rare opportunity to present all my work for um, an audience full of philosophers and philosophers interested in psychology. Uh, so I would very much like to invite you to look at what I present and say, okay, so what does this mean in relation to my own theories and my own thinking or any other philosophical theories uh, that you can think that might relate to? Uh, and so rather sort of come and tell me what it means rather than attack me, uh, which is <coughs> <coughs> uh, what philosophers normally do. I will therefore also downplay my own interpretations of what this means in order to get a better discussion. Anyway, so let's start. Um, so from the beginning, so my colleague Lars Hall and I, we were interested in self-knowledge and introspection. How much do we know about ourselves and how do we come to acquire this knowledge? Uh, and when you try to do experimental work on self-knowledge, uh, it's quite hard because it's very hard to determine an independent measure of truth. That is, so how can you know when people are right and when they're wrong about themselves? And I, I think we all experience this in our daily life when someone we know well, they make a choice or they make an action. When they explain this to you and say, we ask them, why did you do this? And the reasons they give to you, it feels obvious these can't have been the real reasons, but you have no way of questioning the sort of accuracy of, of their own self-explanations. And they can be perfectly sincere and genuinely believe this is why I did this. But to you, there's still no way of uh, sort of uh, challenging their position. So what we wanted to construct was an experimental situation in which we would know from the outside, from the beginning, when people are wrong about themselves, even if they didn't know this themselves. Uh, so this is quite tricky to do in an experiment. So we turned to the professionals, the magicians. So they are experts at controlling people's decisions. And when they say, pick a card, any card, the only thing you know is there's no longer free choice going on, right? <laughs> uh, so we had a few fantastic brainstorming sessions with a group of Swedish magicians. Um, and this is the experiment that came out of, of this uh, discussion. Right. So you have to forgive me for this movie. is a little bit silly, but it shows the method quite in a quite good way. Uh, 
so that sometimes the prefrontal phase could end up with the other one. Watch carefully. The volunteer chooses the card on the left side. But Petra swaps the card and presents the photo to the screen on the right and was actually rejected. It is a card trick, but it's a cheap card trick. Uh, it's based on something uh, that the magicians call black on black. So for each card, there's a hidden card behind it, which is actually the opposite one, where we slide the other card over uh, the black card is hidden. And then uh, Petra just uses his arm to slide down into the, the black card. I mean, the two pots have been tricky here. First the cat, they don't, they don't know. <laughs> Right, so you yeah you get a hang of it. So the <laughs> right. So do you always give him the wrong card? No. So it's all I'll run through a proper study as well. So there is not just a silly movie version. So uh, <laughs> uh, right. So I'll do this in a bit of detail and then less and less detail for for the rest of the presentation. Right. So in this original experiment, so we had. So they do 15 tries out of three are manipulated. So run and, and we have that 20% in all the tries, or in all the experiments, roughly. Uh, so we had uh, one group of uh, manipulated tries where the uh, alternatives were quite similar, and one where they were drastically dissimilar. And down here, it's even a, a sort of uh, brunette, uh, and a blonde and a brunette. And, and in this study, we only used female faces. Uh, so as you saw in the movie, it works with, with both male and female faces. We get to let the participant look at them for two seconds, five seconds, or as long as they wanted to make the decision. Uh, and as long as they wanted, the average was around six seconds. So five and, and even two seconds is, is well, there's a lot of time in psychology experiments to, to make a preference decision. Um, so what we find, which is probably no surprise by now, that very few participants detected this manipulation. Um, so this is to be read like concurrent detection is if they immediately say, hang on, that was not the one I choose. Something is fishy here. Uh, then, of course, we have an extensi extensive debriefing procedure. And then so some of them say afterwards, OK, uh, I felt something was wrong. And then we show them all the cards and, and let them try to pick out which ones were manipulated. And then there's also a number of people that in, in a debriefing, they would say, yes, something was wrong, but they can't pick it out. Or I mean, it's unclear if they detected something or not. But even when they get along, uh, look at them as long as they want, and they are really dissimilar, the detection rate isn't higher than around 30%. So that is the first the basic effect, the choice bandits effect. Uh, but more interestingly, what happens when we look at the verbal reports? What do they say when they motivate a choice they didn't make? So what we find, first of all, is that they, uh, what they say in a manipulated trial is very similar to what they say in a non-manipulated trial. They basically say the same things. So here we have analyzed them in terms of emotionality or specificity or certainty, and they really appear to be the same things. We've done other studies looking at other measures where we compare sort of number of adjectives or uh, pauses and laughter and blah, 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 and all the things you can think of, and we still don't find any real patterns between these classes of verbal reports. So it looks like they are the same, and therefore maybe using the same processes uh, describe them. But also, of course, we can look at what happens when they do describe these faces. What do they say? Do they describe the face they, they, they like from the beginning, or the one they are presented with as the choice? And what we find is, um, we, we find a mix of cases. We, we, there are, because faces are quite nondescript, so I say, if they say I like the prettier one, or the one with the it doesn't tell you which one they actually looked at uh, or described. But we also get clear uh, uh, instances of confabulations, like in this uh, trial. So remember, the person, a male participant at this time, preferred this face, ended up with this, and 
when asked, why did you prefer this face, the person says, so she's radiant. I would rather have approached her at the bar than the other one. I like earrings. <laughs> and she has the earrings, the other one doesn't. So that type of uh, motivation can't have been what drove the choice in the first place. So this basically describes the, the choice blindness effect. And I'll describe a few other studies, but I'll do a few of them today than I normally do. Uh, so when I present this, not just to philosophers, but in general, I get two basic objections. Uh, so I'll run them through just because you all have them in your head. So the first is, okay, so is it replicable? Do you need to sort of uh, be a magician, <laughs> well-trained to do it, or uh, is it only in our lab and so forth? But this, we have replicated this uh, a number of different times in different studies and with different so we've done it with taste and smell, and other groups have done it with uh, touch, but also going into various economic decisions and so forth. And I'll sh show you sort of when we've done it with moral and politi political issues. Um, but what is quite nice is also uh, it's a very robust effect. So I, I found out that this is described on a website for science fair projects. So at least once a month I get emails from students all over the world that have done this. Uh, I've got emails from a sort of a group of fifth graders in Germany that did this with jams. And I, I recently got this one that I really liked. You can't really see it, but this is uh, a girl named Jessica that she did this in at her science fair and she won first prize and was then sent to the regionals and blah, blah, blah. So she sent this to me with, oh, look, I got all the prizes. And <laughs> uh, and then, so, so I sent her a package with sort of cards, how to do it, and then she let you do variations of it. So it's very easy to replicate. And it's also very robust. I mean, we mentioned Barg before. The, this is not one of these kinds of <laughs> stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it's not a between groups design where you get the minimal change in, in walking pace. It's it sort of, it works. <laughs> uh, yes, anyway. So, uh, so that is the first question. The other question is, Okay, is it for real, or is it just an elaborate demand effect? Is it, is it the case that they're actually aware and they just play along to be kind to me, or the <laughs> sort of because they realize what is happening? And I have several reasons why that is not the case, because of course that is the main worry. If that's if they are actually aware, this is not interesting, basically. So the first is the genuine surprise they show when I explain. So the f the guy you saw in the movie. He was the owner of that, uh, it was a photo studio where we were recording. Uh, and he refused to believe that we had switched the cards until, until we showed him the movie of, of actually doing it. Um, and there's also, we have, in the first study, we had a debriefing procedure in which, at the end, I would say, okay, uh, so if they had shown no signs of detection during the experiment, I say, um, okay, so we plan to do a follow-up on this experiment in which we're going to switch some of the pictures. If you had been in that study, do you think you would have noticed the switches? And 85% say, well, of course I would. And then I say, you were in that study, did you <laughs> notice? And it's just the convoluted sort of series of steps to, to trick you there. It's, I mean, they're not aware. And finally, to be certain, we have recently done eye tracking studies uh, where we let participants do the same type of uh, study and we measure their pupil dilation, which is sort of standard measure of surprise or, or uh, cognitive effort, uh, and there we find out, okay, so in uh, non-manipulated trials, the dotted line, this is sort of the curvature of the pupil dilation when, when they are presented, and we get a very strong spike in trials that are classified as detected, and uh, trials that are uh, <coughs> non-detected, you don't see that response. And, and pupil dilation is, I mean, not even professional poker players can really fake or control their pupil dilation. It, it is a strong measure. So we, uh, we have, I mean, in some uh, uh, types of analysis, you, you can get a sense of that the, the non-detected might be a little bit higher than the detected one, so it would be somewhere in between. So there might be s sort of some error uh, going on uh, at, at the very initial state error registration, but it sort of, it never reaches conscious awareness or something. Uh, so there's nothing we see here, but there's something we'd like to pursue if you, with other sort of brain scan, other measures to see if there are some part of the brain that detects a mismatch, but it's then downplayed or something. I mean, 
is, is a very interesting way to explore them, but at least at a basic uh, awareness, they're not aware of this. So if you worry about that, you don't have to. That's just the interpretation. Uh, right, so I'll show you, uh, as I said, we've done a number of different experiments here, but what I'd like to focus on today is uh, this self-observation aspect. So as I said, uh, uh, or added to the title of my talk, the self-interpretation. So first, they interpret their own behavior in order to construct these reasons for having made this choice. But what happens with this confabulatory effort over time? Does it feed back and trickle down and actually change their preferences? So if they were to do this choice again, would they now prefer the face they initially wanted or the one they were led to believe they liked, right? So this uh, initially sort of implicit process of of uh, explaining or, or accepting the manipulation, does this also feed back and change the preferences? And it turns out that, yes, it does. So we did a very simple experiment where we replicated the first study and then added a series of choices afterwards where they get to see the same faces again and, and make a choice. Um, and it turns out that, yes, s uh, they do change their preference uh, in line with the manipulation. So this should just be understood as consistency between first and second choice. So if there is no manipulation, people are very consistent, they would prefer the same face 90% of the time. Uh, but in the manipulated trials, this number drastically drops, which means they will tend to be consistent with uh, the one we sort of uh, led them to believe they liked. So, I mean, that is an interesting question, and we're actually uh, exploring it right now. Because the, the you want to separate the, the decision process from, uh, from, from the confabulatory effort, basically. And so this in itself connects to a large debate in psychology behind the free choice paradigm, which has sort of since the 60s assumed that choices feed back and influence uh, future preferences. But that has fallen in disrepute in recent years because there's a statistical flaw in it so this people do no longer think that choices affect or th there needs to be new experiments so this is fills that gap but in order to act properly fill it of course we need to separate uh, the confabulation from the decision and other things but, but what's clear is yes uh, so they choose the one uh, we gave them. So this is consistency with the original choice. So the, the consistency with the original choice is dropping in the manipulator trials, right? Which means they choose the other one, right? Um, right. Uh, so, yes. So there, there is something going on. It's, it's not just a momentary something you do to in order to overcome the having been faced with the manipulation. It's something that actually f uh, feeds back and alters behavior. Uh, so I'll show you two more studies uh, in which we looked at this preference effect. So this is a recent one we've been just submitted. Uh, so we wanted to see what happens if two people sit in front of and do the task, right? Uh, so in this experiment, the, the task is to decide which person of these two would you rather share a flat with. So this is done on undergraduate students at UCL. So they sort of, this is a, it makes sense, this task, looking at people trying to fill the flat with new people. Um, uh, so in, in this experiment then, so we let two people, they sit together in front of a screen. Uh, and they look at two faces for two seconds. Uh, and the uh, the faces are turned away, and then they have to agree on a choice. They they can do this any way they want, so we don't specify how to, but they have to reach a consensus, and then they click first. Uh, they click sort of either left or right with the mouse, and they do it in order. So they they give a sort of individual response. Then the chosen face come up, or in this case the non-chosen face, <coughs> and they're asked to describe. So why did you, as a group, prefer this face? And then they sort of. They you do this on their own in front of a camera, and then they sort of explain their choice. And then we have, as in the previous experiment, added a second choice face to see if, if 
the, the group preference will be influenced in a similar way as, as the individuals. Uh, so first of all, uh, we, uh, we get a detection rate, I hope on this slide, yes, uh, of around 36% for this in the dyad condition. So, because it could be assumed that dyads, I mean, they have the chance to express their concerns to each other, whether they detect it or not. And they also, as a group, in many other studies, a group perform a lot better than individuals, right? So, but it seems like, I mean, if you compare to a single condition, which we all have, it, it's, it's about double the detection, but it's not more <laughs> than double. So, it's so the effect is basically not more than two people sitting there, you, you can say. But this also opens up, of course, a lot of possibilities for us to do use this in to study other aspects of, of social behavior, <coughs> and, and and we also get uh, what you can call collaborative confabulation when they sort of discuss and together agree on why they did this, and and so there is a lot of things you can play around with with this paradigm, and of course you can add people to the group and, and you can measure dominance and, and all sorts of things, uh, but we also find the same type of preference effect as before. Uh, so this should be understood as, uh, yes, so there's non-manipulated trials. This is the consistency they show normally around 90%. This is manipulated trials. It's a combination of detected and non-detected trials in order to get a, get a sort of a good comparison. Uh, and we find a statistical strong uh, difference between these in, in choice consistency. And if we look at the Manipula ma manipulate the trial as a class, we see that we find a stronger effect for for uh, participants uh, that that didn't detect. So, so you get a, I mean, if you're not aware of anything happening, you get a stronger effect. So this means that there is a similar type of process of self-perception going on even in, in, in the group uh, stage. Uh, um, right. So the next one uh, is a little bit more tricky, and, and uh, for the international audience, I'll, I'll need to set this up a little bit. So we wanted to to uh, look at okay, so can will we find similar choice blindness effects even for things that people care more about and are more knowledge about, uh, such as political uh, attitudes? Um, so this study we did two weeks before uh, a Swedish general election, um, and. Uh, first of all, in Sweden, like in, in, in many other countries, we have two strong coalitions. They are one left wing and one right wing. Uh, and, and that sort of divides the electorate in, in a quite consistently. And, and in this election, all the parties had actually lined up and, and agreed to be in, in or at least the, so you know the two blocks. Um, and when people do this, uh, and you all know this, then when they're polling before an election, the only thing they're interested in is the uncertain voters. How many pe voters are in play? How many can we influence? And what we wanted to say, okay, so what would happen if we applied choice blindness in this? Could we influence more people than just these few uncertain vo voters? What would happen if they would were to engage in, in something like a uh, choice blindness procedure? So uh, we used um, what before this election and, and many others, the something called an election compass is constructed. So all the news outlets will have one of their own, which is sort of a summary of all the questions that divide the two uh, coalitions or, or main uh, alternatives. Things like should, yes, I forgot, so this is in Swedish, right? So things like uh, should, uh, should pet, uh, tax on petrol be increased? Um, so in, uh, in maternity, paternity uh, care, si right now two months of the 13 months we have are respected, are reserved for one of the parents. Uh, this should be divided in the middle. This is a strong left-wing claim. So it should be at least six months each, and, and that needs to be taken out by each person. This type of Swedish for an American audience. <laughs> <laughs> but this is what we, we're interested in and, and vote about. Anyway. Big issues, <laughs> real issues. Um, anyway, so so what we did was to approach people in the city with a questionnaire and have and ask them, okay, can you fill in this questionnaire? Uh, and they would 
sort of fill in what they think. After they fill it in, we'd ask, okay, can we discuss your answers on these questions? And we did. And then we add a what sort of summation sheet that would be, uh, so if you lean left or right, so in, in Swedish, left is red and, and, blue and right is blue, so it's the opposite of US. But so we'd say, okay, so you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine red ones, so you lean to the left in, in your voting intention. Um, so and before they filled this in, they had uh, filled in recurrent voting intentions, sort of on, on, a, on a scale, and at the end we let them fill in another one. So here is a little movie showing um, w how the actual experiment li looked, because of course there is a trick involved. Right. <coughs> We walked up to people in the street, so asked them to state their voting intention, explain the workings of the questionnaire. And while they were filling in <coughs> their answers, we were looking over their shoulder and filling in a separate answer sheet. <laughs> uh, and then, of course, we know from the beginning if they were leaning left or right, so we the ambition was to make their answers go in the opposite direction. Uh, and when they were done, we would sort of hide that under and ask, okay, so let's discuss your answers. And now we switch them. <laughs> so, yes, so the trick is <laughs> to just <laughs> glue a reverse set of answers on top of the other one. And then we walk through the answers. Uh, okay, so how what's your opinion on, on tax, on petrol? So how did you reason here and blah, blah, blah. Uh, and then, uh, <coughs> yes, we sum this up, uh, if they lean left or right, and then they get the chance in the end to state their voting intention again. So this is on a one to 100 scale and they make a cross. Uh, and that's the sort of the end of, of the interaction. <coughs> Right. Right. So, first of all, uh, so here the it, it's a little bit different than the others because you can't really know how many how many of the trials you're going to manipulate in order to switch them. So some you need to switch twelve, and some just a few. And and but, but that's the ambition. So it's you don't get that clear individual uh, separation, but uh, or the same pattern for all of them. Uh, but it turned out that quite not very many, no one detected the manipulation as such, because it's impossible. Uh, so, uh, so what happens is some of them would say, N I must have misread that question, or this, nah, and then change back while you do the, the sort of summation. And they might change one or two of them, but not all of the manipulations and so forth. Uh, but what we end up is having switched 91 of the manipulators one of the participants, sort of the direction of it. So if they leaned left, we turned them right. And they didn't detect more of them uh, than that sort of, in all, they were confronted with the opposite in 91% of the time. Um, and if we look at the, the verbal reports at this stage, when they explain manipulated choices, so it's quite interesting because you get an much more detail. Uh, I mean, this is real. Uh, issues. These, these then they have real arguments for it. So I'll give you just an example of what it can look like. Uh, so this, so here the participant, uh, remember that the, he, or sh yeah, it doesn't matter, uh, previously from the beginning preferred the opposite. So, uh, and then we can take question two. Large-scale governmental surveillance of email and internet traffic ought to be permissible as a means to combat international crime and terrorism. You agree to some extent with this statement, yes, that it should be allowed. How did you reason here? Well, like, as it's so hard to get at international crime and terrorism, I think there should be those kinds of tools. Like, and here the person remembers an argument from the newspaper in the morning. In the newspa to, uh, newspaper today, it's said that I can, like, listen to mobile phones from prison if a gang leader tries to continue his crimes from inside. 
And I think it's madness that we have so little power and that we can't stop those things when we actually have the possibility to do so. Uh, right? And then there's a little bit of a reverse. So, so I don't like that they have access to everything I do, but I still think it's worth it in the long run. So if you just saw this report, there's nothing to assume that this is not this person's real attitude. This is what we say, this is what we do. Uh, so of course I've chosen a juicy one, but <laughs> still, I mean, this is what they look like. And, and we have external examiners look at, the sort of rate these for what this person <laughs> really think. And there is this, I mean, you get this pattern, uh, there's no doubt. Um, and then, okay, so what happened then to the voting intentions of the participants? So you can measure this in different ways, but if we here sum it up, uh, like a polling institute would do, you'd find that uh, around 8%, so I'm just see if I have the right numbers out there. Yes, around 8% around uh, switch the voting intention from the left to the right in the final voting. And they, they could have had like a strong voting intention going in different directions. Uh, uh, a lot of them shows from having been certain to adding, putting themselves in the very middle. Uh, some of them, and this is interesting because these are some, there are a number of uncertain voters. They, of course, move, or not of course, but some, they, they would move from being uncertain to finding their own position. Uh, and, and a few of them are uncertain both before and after, but it means that there's a much larger proportion of people that are willing to shift their attitudes if they behave or sort of engage in this sort of self-conversation and, and, and constructing arguments for the other side. So it's, it's there is something in this process, because there are a lot of studies showing if you just tell people arguments, like you should vote this, it's going to just back backfire. It, it would have the opposite effect. So just but letting people argue with themselves might have a different effect. Uh, anyway, so, so if we're going to end this, the choice blindness uh, session, um, so it seems like we at least partially uh, infer our preferences from observing our own choices. There's something here that feeds back, and there's a constructive element of, of uh, preference preferences that, that are quite visible uh, in this study, uh, in, in this set of studies. Um, and uh, I mean, there are, of course, many different future studies to make. One we're doing now is to see if how lasting is this preference change. Of course, we can't. We would love to do this before and then after an election, but that you can't do. So, you, But you can check over a number of weeks and see if this persists. Uh, in, the, in the case, the current result looks like, yes, there is some sort of lingering effects. It's not just minutes after, it's, it's actually weeks after. Uh, and as I said, there's a lot of things you can do with groups. And when we collaborate with, we have a collaboration, collaboration with Unilever, we uh, they we asked so you what do you what would you like to us to study with choice blindness? So the their absolute favorite topic was stock cubes. So we do <laughs> if they could choose anything. So in the ingredient list of stock cubes, and of course you can manipulate that around, and people would say, oh, this is more natural than this, and even if you change that. So anyway, so th this is sto still sort of uh, a research paradigm we're running around with. So now I'm going to present three um, other studies, uh, which of course they have overlap, but, but they are somewhat different. Um, so in the choice blindness experiments, so we've never really addressed the choices as such or the decisions behind leading to a choice. We just intervene at the end and, and, uh, and then uh, sort of go for the post uh, hoc construction phase. So what we wanted to do here is, okay, so can we move closer into the decision process and actually influence that? And are there any parallels in this sort of self-perception or self-influence that we might exploit here? Uh, so this is work led by my graduate student, Philip Parnemetz, and it was, it was recently published a, a few months ago. Uh, but I'll, I'll give you, so here this also needs a little bit of background. Uh, so in eye-tracking uh, literature, this is a uh, well-known effect called the gaze cascade effect. Uh, it basically shows that if you have two options to choose between, uh, the longer 
into the decision process, or the closer you are to actually making a decision, your eyes tend to look more towards the alternative you're going to choose. Uh, and this pattern is visible even before the participants are aware of, now I'm going to make this choice, right? Uh, so there is an increased likelihood to, uh, to look at the chosen alternative. Okay, so what we thought, the can we use this to actually influence people's decisions? Uh, so the hypothesis was that, okay, so imagine that um, you're faced with a question, murder is sometimes justifiable, and you have two options, sometimes justifiable, never justifiable, and your eyes look towards these two different alternatives on the screen. If we were to dis interrupt them when they were looking at this side or have looked more at this option, uh, would they be more likely to pick this one compared to if we interrupted them here? So the research question uh, was basically, uh, can we randomly pick an alternative and get people to choose it? Uh, and in this experiment, this is a little bit complicated, uh, but so the sign of it is, okay, so they hear a statement like murder is sometimes justifiable in, in, in a headset. They are presented with two alternatives, sometimes justifiable, never justifiable. And then they are asked to choose now somewhere between one, uh, between zero and th not zero, but uh, within three seconds. At but <coughs> and then they have to click either left or, or uh, right. Uh, but then we randomly determined one of these to be the target, so we do this beforehand. And then we set up a simple decision, decision rule. So whenever they had looked at the target alternative for s uh, 750 milliseconds, and the at least 700 milliseconds, and the other 250 milliseconds, they would be prompted to give the re response. So this would increase the probability that they'd looked at this alternative longer, but also that they might have looked at it uh, at the very end of, of the d decision process. So this, but this was the simple rule. Would this influence sort of the decision process? Uh, so here is just the kind of um, example questions. So hurting defenseless animals is often one of the worst things one can do, sometimes bad, always bad. So it's classic type of moral dilemmas. Also, we had to uh, formulate these not as simple yes or no, because then you can infer what the other alternative is. So you only need to look at one of them. But if they are a little bit, I mean, of course, one is pro and one is con, but, but it's, yeah. Uh, and we also did this with a number of factual uh, questions, like which city is bigger, this and this, and, and, sort of and they were chosen to be around 50%. Well, they're always correct or not correct, but the average response would be 50% correct or not correct. So this was the basic experiment. Um, and what we found was that, yes, it is indeed possible to influence uh, people's decisions simply by <coughs> tracking their decision and interrupting them at, at different times based on their viewing behavior. Uh, so here, the what you compare against is, is the chance level, because it's randomly we randomly pick one alternative, uh, and we find that between 55 and 60 percent of the times are the participants would pick the target alternative simply by tracking and interrupting the choice, and, th and the same with factual. Uh, so this, uh, and we also measure afterwards, of course, are you aware of the manipulation? N none of the participants saw any connection between their viewing behavior and, and when the interrupt when the prompt came right but we also see that there are no differences in comprehension when they choose the target or the non-target so it's not that they pick they follow the the manipulation only when they don't understand the question or or, or have no uh, and uh, the same when you compare how they rated the importance of the issues so it's not just the the, the ones they didn't care about um, uh, so, of course, this study can be uh, interpreted in many different ways at many different levels. But, but if we want to stick with the sort of theme of today's presentation is that there is some sort of 
inference going on from the participants. So we when we interrupt them, they are either looking at the alternative uh, we want them to choose, or they have looked at it more. And then there is some sort of inference process going on that, okay, so I must also prefer that alternative because my behavior tells me that I have sort of chosen preferential behavior towards it. Um, and, and of course, in future studies, we, we can connect this to verbal reports as we've done in the previous one, see if what would happen if we ask them to actually motivate this choice and not the others. You could add incentives, see if the effect would disappear to share at this, which one should you give money to? And I mean, all the kind of things that would make it more relevant or, or interesting or important for the participants. Uh, anyway, so that is one set of experiments we've been doing uh, lately. Uh, I'll see if I hope to be able to do two more types of experiments. Uh, so the next we call voice blindness. And it's we call it basically just because it sort of fits nice with choice blindness. Uh, but <laughs> the research question here is this. Uh, okay, so what would happen if you said one thing but heard yourself say something else? <laughs> Simply. <laughs> uh, so, because uh, that question relates to a lot of issues in, I mean, it's like Forrester's old quote, how can I know what I think until I see what I say? Uh, to what extent do we rely on a prior intention to speak in uh, determining sort of both the meaning of what we say, but also the agency of, so at what point do we uh, sort of think that this is me doing it or, or someone else? And so there's a lot of complex issues within both speech production, but also sense of agency that would be addressed or related to a question like this. Uh, but it's easier said than done, uh, this uh <coughs> question. So this is uh, work led by another PhD student, Andreas Lind. Uh, so he's now just completed, it took six years to get this to work. But I'll show you how what it looks like anyway. Uh, so we this is a quite simple experiment in, in the setup. So we let people do a standard Stroop test. So the task is to uh, say what uh, color the uh, the word is written in and not be confused by the, the actual name. So it has the neat structure that they say a lot of words, uh, and yes, discrete words. You can uh, sit in the next room and record what they say, and you can trim these recordings into small snippets of sound, and uh, then you can uh, insert them when they say one thing, uh, they will hear themselves say something else. <laughs> uh, so they we have special made like sound blocking headsets and, 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 uh, uh, and then there is a voice trigger that would insert the word when they start speaking. <coughs> anyway, uh, and then this would be followed by a question. <laughs> so what did you say? Uh, to measure the sort of the agency of it. Mm. Uh, right, so the the words we picked was uh, grå or grön, so they're quite similar sounding words, so grey and green in Swedish. Um, uh, and we had, so th the Stroop tests are quite rapid, so we had uh, quite a large number of trials, so 200 something, uh, and in the beginning we recorded and trimmed, and after a while we'll start to insert. We had four manipulations. Um, uh, and then also the same type of words without manipulation, so it wouldn't be suspicious every time it said grey on the screen. Uh, so that was the basic setup. Um, right, so um, what we found, first of all, is uh, not surprisingly that the timing uh, is, is important. So it's quite hard to get the timing uh, right. But if the timing is within uh, 5 to 20 milliseconds, uh, what we had sort of think is an ideal timing window, the detection rate is around 30%. And so if it's, it's longer, uh, the detection rate rises, but it's not 100%. So here's also important to say, which I forgot at this point, uh, 
Y yes, it's it's so if you detect one trial, uh, say say that it arrives sort of half a second out of sync, th the task change because then you detect almost all of them because it's not that you can't do <laughs> it if you say. <coughs> If that's the only thing you try to listen to, you detect. So these numbers are corrected for, so if you detect one, you don't count the other trials. So this is sort of, these are trials done while still under, sort of non, not being suspicious. Um, but at least there is a large proportion that don't detect that we'd switch them. But the more interesting question then is of course, okay, so what happens when they answer what did you say question? Uh, so what we find is, uh, that a large proportion of them say uh, what they heard, basically. So what did you say? They said re Ray, they answer green. Uh, but then we also found, found that there is a lot of other types of, um, where because, and this is the tricky bit with the, with the Stroop test, right? Because there is an objectively right and wrong answer to this. And they would, even if they don't remember what they said, they re remembered the screen and, and, and sort of the, the, the visual. So they would, try, they would sort of correct themselves. Gray, no gray, or I meant gray. And, and uh, so they accept the agency of the reversal. So they think they said green, but then they try to correct themselves in, in order. Uh, and here is also, uh, in the debriefing, uh, a number of them said, Yes, it was strange because I did a number of mistakes before the question came, uh, and then I corrected myself and, and said the sort of the thing, uh, the correct answer rather than the thing I said. So all of these, but all of these trials indicate some sort of acceptance of agency, in and then there are a few trials at the end of that don't we we have no idea they they don't detect the switch, but they don't change anything, so we don't know. But anyway, it seems like it's clear that something here happens. Uh, to some extent they accept uh, the mani manipulation. Uh, and this is, so we connect this to this debate of, of um, ad, yeah, agency, whether it's the sort of, uh, what Tim, Michael, mm, sort of comparators or narrators, if, if it's the sort of what's the driving force, it's the comparison between the uh, the intention and the outcome and, and there you find uh, that that match and that's the agency or if you look at your own behavior and, and from that one uh, infer it sort of uh, so f we see this as, as supporting that kind of self interpretation framework rather than a strong uh, agency from based on on in the representations but but it's open open for interpretation uh, in the future studies what we really would like to do um, is to put this in a proper social context when people speak to each other. So you can get the full conversational clues in. So you'd say something and the respondent would react to what you think you hear, uh, or, or what you hear yourself say. So they would, uh, s so, because what we want to know is, uh, uh, or want to properly address is the relationship to the intention to speak. So here we have a right and wrong answer on the screen, which makes it tricky. So you don't, can't really address the original intention because it's sort of specified by the task. Another one we play around with is sort of have a STEM completion task where there is, is open if you're going to say, I can't come up with a good example, but hat or hit, because it's a gap in the middle and you can say one, not the others, and then you manipulate it so you get a mismatch with the original intention, would we find the same effect here? Then it would strongly address the, the uh, sort of semantic specificity and word production and all the good stuff. Uh, and now my time.